politics without the soap opera with unfiltered constitutional conservative truth. The Conservative Review with Daniel Horowitz. And welcome back, friends, Romans and taxpayers, fellow American patriots, peaceful, loving Americans to the Conservative Review podcast here on this fine Thursday, October 17th. And yes, all you want as taxpayers are to live in peace. You want to live unencumbered by government, but you want government to do its core job of protecting you. Yesterday, we had a terrific show uh, chronicling the return of the crime wave in many, many cities, many parts of the country, some disturbing trends we have witnessed that remind us of the late 80s when crime was rampant before it was put in check for the last 25 years. Now, it's bad enough to have a government certainly local governments that become weak on crime, on American criminals. But imagine aggravating that problem by importing other countries' criminals, and then rather than getting rid of other countries' criminals, you have the localities where most of them live work together to ensure that as many of the worst of the worst of other countries' criminals, and I mean other countries' criminals, get to stay whether it's rapists, whether it's violent transnational gang members, drug traffickers, uh, drunk drivers, you name it, um, there is no floor to the problem of sanctuary cities that we are seeing today. Uh, The core job of government is really to protect our security. Local government more internally, federal government from external threats. So imagine you now have local governments working to thwart the federal government, from protecting us from what is really inherently an external threat, but then becomes embedded in all of our communities. Um, One of the worst actors that we've spoken about on this program, we've written so many articles that I can't even remember every case, is King County, the Seattle area on Washington State, really large swaths of the state due to state and local laws and ordinances that have recently been passed, Um, Google my name and King County Sanctuary and you'll see about a dozen different articles. Um, It's it's gang members, child molesters. Um, We had this case of a rapist who raped a disabled woman twice, served just nine months in prison, which is a whole nother story. And he was just let out um, without informing ICE. No sane person would want this. No sane person did want this until about a decade ago. But something has changed, and we're going to try to explore what is happening, what we could do about it, with a very special guest. We're, we're joined on the line today, um, where it's our privilege to have Natalie Asher. She is the field office director of the Seattle ICE office, which is responsible certainly for Washington State, as well as the other Pacific Northwest West states and Alaska but she also served the last three years in D.C. as the first deputy and then director of the entire enforcement and removal operations under ICE. So very much has a national view on what is going on um, in, in, uh, in terms of sanctuaries, in terms of the latest trends from the border, gangs, drugs. She um, served in the U.S. military as a Russian linguist and a military intelligence analyst. In 1995, she joined the National Drug Intelligence Intelligence Center as an intelligence research specialist. So that will be very critical to examining the connection between the cartels, gangs, and drugs. And then she worked in the INS, which later you know, became ICE Enforcement and Removal since 1996. Certainly a lot of experience there. Hey, Natalie, it's really a pleasure to have you with us today on the Conservative Review Podcast. Hey, good morning. Thanks so much for having me on the line today. Really appreciate your uh, giving me this opportunity. Absolutely. And yes, I did forget it is morning um, on the West Coast. We tend to be pretty arrogant and think time revolves around the East Coast here. Um, (laughs) Gosh. Yeah, I I, I don't know where to start here. Um, You know, this is so multifaceted because, again, it's the convergence of crime, sovereignty, drugs, cartels gangs, so much going on, the rule of law, anarchy. Um, 
just start off more broadly before we get into some specifics about your area. So in, in 2009, there were just 40 sanctuary jurisdictions. I never even heard of the term back then, and I've covered this issue for about 15 years. In 2016, that number jumped to 338, and then as of 2018, 564. And I'm sure that number is probably more this year. And again, they are largely the jurisdictions that have the largest populations of illegal aliens, criminal aliens. What I don't understand is there's a lot of cute excuses being given to thwart ICE's um, operations. But what suddenly changed when you started in your career in the first you know, 15 years or so? Wasn't this not much of an issue? So, yeah, I mean, you, you've laid out the background quite accurately. It, it, it is remarkable, uh, all of the changes, Daniel, that have occurred, certainly since my, my career. Um, but I, I think in large part what we have going on here, and it's just it's simply, it's simply politics above public safety. I mean, that's, that is what is just so um, – it's, tra- it's, a, it's a travesty. Uh, and I think perhaps, you know, I'd like to kind of give benefit of the doubt that at some point when, when, uh, politicians were sitting around contemplating, uh, you know, what does sanctuary mean to whom were they providing sanctuary? Uh, I, I think the concept, if it was designed to, to help pull out of the shadows, those, uh, you know, we still, uh, use the legal and accurate a definition of illegal aliens who are in our country, uh, who um, are, you know, in the shadows working illegally. Um, yes, they have broken federal laws that they are here illegally first and foremost. But you know, they're not hardened criminals. They're not the gangbangers. They're they're trying to find a better way of life. Perhaps that was the original intention of sanctuary to to protect. Those folks, I, I don't know, but what it has absolutely become, Daniel, is this is uh, all about um, protecting criminal aliens. I mean, this is the consequence of what sanctuary laws uh, have have created, and and the, the it is growing beyond cities. I mean, you're well aware of what's happened with California as a whole. Um, and the same thing is happening with Washington State, and I'm sure that there are other states slated to go complete sanctuary as a state. And what this is doing is it has put gridlock in our ability uh, to do um, uh, to execute the federal laws in the, which we have authority uh, to enforce. And 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 our you know, our line of business is we prioritize as a, as a law enforcement agency what we work, just as any other law enforcement agency does. And so I think we would all agree, regardless of political views, et cetera, we have a tremendous number of individuals in this country who are here illegally. But when you parse out uh, from a public safety perspective and you sort of tear uh, those who come as criminals or who came here and became criminals, gangbangers, you know, malintent while they're here in our country, and then you have the others thereafter. Well, we as a federal law enforcement agency only have, we have extremely limited resources. So just as all other law enforcement agencies do, we have to um, prioritize, uh, prioritize uh, our work. And so, of course, to the to the top, and there's plenty of work to do so, is are these criminal aliens. Sanctuary laws uh, have prevented us from being able to be uh, effective in conducting that part of our work. No, I mean, and, and there's there's no doubt about that because, uh, like you said, obviously uh, the laws that you are tasked with enforcing, which, by the way, were reinforced in 1996 right around when you started – by Ira Ira, which passed the Senate by voice vote, and it was signed by President Bill Clinton, um, is really to enforce law against every illegal alien. Obviously, with so many, you know, transnational gang members and certainly, 
you know, drunk drivers, things that are really public safety, you're going to prioritize with a force that you have, which is smaller than the NYPD and you're, you're nationwide. So to be clear, when we talk about sanctuaries, it is exclusively a population of people that wind up in a local jail because they committed another crime, right? Right. That's correct. And and what this by sanctuary, I mean, and again, I mean, there's still going back to the national sort of perspective and, and to your point, having just returned from uh, my three years in D.C., I can tell you that it the three years since I've been gone, I, I'm still my head is spinning as to uh, coming back to the great Pacific Northwest <laughs> and really watching um, again the result, the consequences of what was sort of this creep of, of sanctuary, uh, you know, policies here and there, then growing to the to the cities, then spreading to counties, and now to the state level. Um, in fact, there is in Washington State, there's a, a bill that was passed, um, 5497, which essentially mirrors California uh, Bill 54 in being a, a sanctuary state. And that sunsets December 2021, where essentially, Daniel, all uh, state resources, um, that being jails, uh, DMV, any kind of agency that has information, particularly related to foreign-born, will be completely cut off from ICE. And many of the jails, the DMV, many of the, d the databases that we ordinarily had access to in our law enforcement capacity have already been uh, locked down from us. And so you know, th this is going to come to full fruition the end of next year when this wall will be so tall and so wide, uh, there will continue to be um, really bad guys let loose to go back into their communities because that's where they, that's, that's where their victims are. This is the irony of the sanctuary yep. piece, right? It's because if it was meant to, again, um, somehow protect that particular community. Well, you've done you've done the reverse. You're protecting <laughs> and allowing those criminal aliens to yep. be released uh, versus being transferred to to ICE for us to you know vet, see if these guys are, are amenable to removal proceedings, and rather be released into the community, which then means I have to go into that community and find my target. And and so now it's like you can, there's no pleasing any of these entities. So you don't want me in your communities, okay? But now by pushing the sanctuary and not allowing my officers to go into the jails to conduct the interviews as we had done for decades um, or to allow for safe transfer of criminal aliens to our custody, Rather, you've released them. You've not told us. You've not honored our detainers. I still have a mission. And our piece of promoting public safety is to ensure that these criminal aliens who are uh, continue to um, uh, promote, you know, fear, uh, gang activity, go back to their victims within their own communities. I now have to go find them. So I'm going to be in your communities. And guess what? By and large, we are going to encounter other individuals who are here illegally, who are associated to the target. And those individuals will be coming with us as well. Whereas before, had we the safe transfer of individuals, us going into the jails, conducting the interviews, I would not be in your communities to the degree that we are today. So I want to understand why logistically it is so tough to catch some of these people. I often see cases where they were at large for two, three years as a result of being let go by a sanctuary before you guys could get a hold of them. And I want to use a case study for this discussion. So you you had a twin, you know, well, a pair of uh, gang killings recently, the last couple of weeks in King County, one in Bellevue, one somewhere else in King County. Um, where both of them 
had, as, as always, most people don't go from zero to murder in one shot. According to BJS, I believe 78% of murderers in general um, have a prior rap sheet. And usually you could prevent that. Now with Americans, you know, <laughs> certain places are pretty lenient. They let go, they, they get let go pre-trial on bond. Even after the trial, they don't get locked up. They get locked up for a short period of time. They're out. But, you know, the principle is with a criminal alien, well, that should be the last crime they commit, and you should never have to deal with their recidivism. But one of these guys, Orjeta Vega, was arrested um, October 8th for a brutal gang murder. He was originally resettled in America as a UAC. That's a whole nother story, a whole nother problem just nationally. But, you know, from the information I got, um, this guy was locked up two times before another guy was four times before in this case in one one case he had a dui which again that's that's very serious um even if that's the only thing he does you, you certainly don't want them on the streets and um he was released before you guys could encounter him in another case um another dui he was released in defiance of a detainer what people often ask is, why do you need a detainer? Let's say they don't honor it. Can you just wait at the jail and, and grab the guy? So, okay. So, well, I suppose that we could. And on the occasion, in, until, um, you know, there there's absolute lockdown in, in which we don't even know when the, rele the release times are going to be conducted, because that's sometimes how we do our work, Daniel. In fact, I mean, this is, to me, it's just so offensive that we as a federal law enforcement agency, uh, my officers put their lives, uh, their safety on the line every single day. It is an oath that they took, yes, um, but they are out there uh, contributing to their part of promoting public safety. And we have been marginalized and minimized to the point where the most, uh, in most situations, the only way we are able to track or have any knowledge of, of these individuals, uh, foreign-born criminal aliens, either in custody or being released, is we only have access uh, to to public records. In other words, with just any, you know, Joe Smith on the line sure. could look up uh, the booking uh, release jail system. That's what we have been uh, marginalized to do in our and job. And you never know when they're going to be released. And so... And so we, we know in general terms when there are release times, right? But we do the best that we can with what we do not have, if that makes sense. So on the occasion, yes, we, we are left to uh, being near the jail in anticipation of our target being released. That is no way to conduct safe and effective uh, law enforcement. Uh, it, it's, it's preposterous, actually. And so um, that is what we are left to do. This whole uh, sort of fictional line about, you know, King County coming back out is saying, well, listen, it's not that we won't work with you. It's just you guys know, you know, our attorneys have assessed this and and we will work with you, but you need to give us a judicial warrant. Mm. Well, they, they know good and well that we don't need a warrant. Uh, the, we don't need uh, th that detainer in and of itself is a request um, for them just to notify us so that we can be there timely to get take that indiv individual into our custody. Um, I mean, it's in the law, right? In the Immigration and Nationality Act, Section 287, I mean, it, it says that we have the authority to arrest aliens without a judicial warrant. So, well, it, it was e even before then. I mean, uh, let me know if I'm getting this right. They don't realize that they're actually inadvertently explaining the philosophy behind sovereignty because they're saying, well, get a get a criminal warrant. But they're missing the point. You can't get a criminal warrant because it's not it, it, it's it's a civil violation. And by correct. definition, you don't need a criminal warrant because it's sovereignty. So the way I always understood it in Turner v. Williams in 1904, the Supreme Court said that detention or temporary confinement 
as part of the means necessary to give effect to the exclusion or expulsion were held valid. So I mean, not just to certainly you could get them out, but even the confinement to get into a car, to get into a house, you're allowed to take them because they're not Americans and you're not trying to criminally convict them. You're just trying to enforce sovereignty. And then um, James Erdell in 1799 for our audience here, um, he was one of the crafters of Article three of the judicial branch of government. Uh, he wrote in, in a case, any alien coming to this country must or ought to know that this being an independent nation that has all the rights concerning the removal of aliens, which belong by law of nations to any other, that while he remains in the country in the character of an alien, and this is even legally, he can claim no other privilege than such as an alien is entitled to. Um, as a, and consequently, whatever risk he may incur in that capacity is incurred voluntarily. So it's like you come to my home. I can't lock you up and throw you in the attic, you know, without a due process. I can't punish you, but I could push you out. Isn't mm -hmm. that basically the philosophy of why you don't need a criminal warrant? Right. And, and wow, you're you're way smarter than I am in, in that lane. I'm 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 just the operator here. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, but. But, you know, and everything that you say is it 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 just further sort of, you know, fortifies th this whole this whole sort of it just blows my mind, truly, that that, that this is what people are being uh, led to believe that all we need. It's not that we don't want to work with you. You know what you need to give us. It's this criminal warrant when, in fact, the local officials, the state officials, they're very well versed in in sort of their you know agendas. And the bottom line is, there's no judge in this country who has the authority to issue a warrant for civil civil immigration violation. I mean, that's what we do. That's what Congress set up yeah. um, in their laws. And it, it's good business sense. It's good law enforcement. Sense. It's good use of government resources. Sure, so, which is why they don't see. They don't see a federal judge either. They see a DOJ administrative immigration judge. Um, and that's only if they even have to. In many cases, really expedited removal um, is for anyone here who can't prove he's been here for more than two years. Um, you're you're entitled to uh, uh, air your claim in front of an immigration officer, not an immigration judge even. So right. um, it's, it's all over our laws. I want to move on to our laws. Um, 8 U.S.C. 1324. Um, you are not allowed to induce, encourage, harbor, um, transport illegal aliens. I don't understand how these sanctuaries that take active steps to harbor them, how they're not in violation of that. So, so that's something, uh, you know, outside of my lane again, in, in that that's mm. a, a, a legal sort of debate and, and decisions that are much higher than, than my pay grade. Um, but, but on, on, on the surface, it, it, I mean, I, I can see where one could make that argument um, because it is essentially protecting and aiding abetting knowingly, right. That these individuals are here illegally uh, and that they are amenable to removal proceedings. So it, it's, it's very complex it, and and the, the shame of all of this, uh, Daniel, is that really we in ERO specifically, enforcement and removal operations, the deportation officers, um, you know, we are an integral part of promoting public safety. Oh, yeah. Just how can anyone deny that? And uh, it is just a logical and, and smart way to conduct our business if we can do so contained in the con in the confines of a jail while someone is still incarcerated and just being about you know to be released from that situation to for us to vet them and make that determination as to you know a couple of things number one are they amenable to proceedings it's critical that we have that interview with the alien before us so that we can um you know make sure. a, a solid right review uh to determine sort of the disposition of this individual. And so when you take that away from us, um, you know, we're left to, again, redirecting our resources, going into the communities, um, and then looking at others who we otherwise would not, could have not come to our attention, 
um, because we're still going to get our target. And, you know, and it's not just, and to your point about some other individuals, I mean, we apply prosecutorial discretion just like any other law enforcement entity. And and if I can take a couple minutes just to sort of dispel mm. for your audience and, and hopefully just kind of simplify, um, you know, our processes, just like any other law enforcement agency, you know, we're going to have more people uh, arrested or more people who we encounter uh, than resources to address the situation, specifically as it relates to detaining them. So that's another huge piece of misinformation. Yep. For example, and just, and, and like just to put a number on that, and this is old, but but according to a DHS budget request from 2013, I've seen they estimated yeah. roughly two million um, criminal aliens in the country, meaning aliens that were arrested. They got this data through the Secure Communities Program, and that was before the entire influx of Central Americans. That was in 2013. Right. Is it true? Isn't it true that you have what is it, seven thousand ERO officers? Well, our agency as a component ERO is just shy of of uh, eight thousand. Eight thousand. We okay. have we have um, maybe sixty five hundred deportation officers. And and, and, and so people understand at, the NYPD is about twenty thousand. Right. right. And if you take from that, I would say boots on the ground, actually conducting daily operations. You know, you got to you got to lob off the managers and all of that. You're maybe looking at five thousand deportation officers mm. with this tremendous charge of enforcing in, in, uh, interior immigration enforcement. <laughs> so, to that to your point and to illustrate, right, the resources are are strained. The problem is far greater. Um, so. Not everyone, this is the other piece of misinformation, not everyone that we encounter gets booked into a facility, uh, and then the misinformation is somehow, you know, we, we go out in the throes of the night, we, we bring them into custody, and then within a week, they're gone. I mean, this is just, that's just not, we, we can't do that. Um, you know, we encounter far more people uh, and put them in various degrees of, say, release on order of recognizance while they await their proceedings, perhaps uh, putting them as an alternative to detention on, on ankle bracelets just to ensure their appearances before the court. Um, so we're graduating in sort of, you know, their, their, their type of management uh, while they are in proceedings. And then, of course, we go higher to if you pose a, a flight risk, or by law, by statutes that you are mandatory detention, those are the individuals that actually go to the facilities for detention. Um, so if, because if you think about it, if we, if everyone we encountered, we put into a bed, well, then I would have, we would have hundreds of thousands of beds. Oh, yeah. And that's not the case. So prosecutorial discretion is applied. Um, for those who actually eventually have to go to detention. That, that tends to be a huge piece of information, misinformation, at least out here in the Pacific Northwest, that everyone we encounter, we, you know, somehow book in and, and throw in our facility. Um, yeah, I mean, what, what, you only have like 52 or so thousand beds? Well, yeah. At this, right, nationally, right. And, and uh, though we were funded by Congress at, you know, 40,520, something like that, I mean, Obviously, addressing the influx that was just complete sort of, you know, we were steamrolled with all these numbers, as you all well know. We are hovering in that in that 50,000 range. Yes. Um, but but again, when you then look at, you know, who we encounter, 90 percent of uh, the individuals that we encounter fall in one of those priority buckets. They're criminal aliens with convictions or they are criminal aliens with convictions, uh, charges pending, or they are individuals who were previously removed and now they've committed, you know, uh, yet another, uh, they've broken yet another law. They, they, they're back into the country. They're not supposed to be here. And then the fourth bucket are individuals who were ordered removed and they failed to remove. So now they are a fugitive. They are at large. Those are the four buckets that keep us very, very busy. So, oh my gosh! Uh, yeah, you know, I mean, so so we are we're we're 
we're applying, we're making good use of the limited resources we have in our part in promoting public safety. And it is so unfortunate that it, it seems quite logical, a no-brainer. You got a bad guy who's from a foreign country, not supposed to be here, uh, and they're in a local jail. We're saying, listen, you know, he he he's not supposed to be here. Like, we need him in our custody so that we can deal with him. You would think that the communities would welcome that. The politicians would welcome that because that certainly is – a force multiplier for them and their responsibility to promote public safety as well. But instead, they're being released only to reoffend more often than not. And then we kind of have to wait. Sadly, they graduate in their crimes. We have the gang issues. We, and, and in this case, that you reference the, these graduated to, to, to homicide. And, you know, ha, where's the logic in that? So that's what I wanted to ask you about, because I'm here on the East Coast and, and the big story here, um, whether it's Maryland and Virginia, New Jersey, Long Island, Massachusetts, what you see in those states is precisely around 2014. That's a it's a watershed year, um, an influx of Central American teens that fueled the growth on the East Coast. It was it was mainly um, MS-13 and 18th Street Gang, and in turn, because in the recent years, the transnational gangs have become distributors for the cartels, that is a big part of why you see the blip on the map with the drug crisis going bonkers 2014, 2015, 2016. That's the story we're seeing on the East Coast. I didn't know you had much of that in the Pacific Northwest, but then I saw these two cases. Have you had a lot of these Central American teens that are fueling the growth of other gangs in your area? So that you're, you're, you're very observant to all this, Daniel. What's interesting is, and I'll, I'll just kind of use the term of, of aging out, right? Because you're seeing that 2014, 2015, to your point, this tremendous influx of this, of these unaccompanied children who came and perhaps they were maybe under our radar or, or, if those who were, um, say, in the juvenile detention system, right, they're already causing problems, um, but they're protected that they were falling under the sort of the, the juvenile process. That is the same thing that was going on here in the Pacific Northwest. Um, certainly not to the numbers that you just referenced there on the East Coast, sure. which I'm very familiar with as well. But you you have to look at the West Coast as this grand corridor of you know, feeding from California through Oregon into Washington State. There, there's that's a pipeline of individuals of movement of these folks um, who have now come to settle in the Pacific Northwest to include many of these unaccompanied kids who uh, settled with their sponsor, their family, or what have you, and then only to get involved themselves in the local gang problems. So in these two instances, uh, well, particularly in, in the one where the, the Bellevue murder, I mean, this guy came, they settled here. He was a, as a juvenile and it's, there's no question he was already in, involved in the gang uh, activities. And now he ages out. He comes into the adult system. We become aware of him through that. That's when we could have brought him into our, at least taken one off the street, right? Um, but I, I think that we are going to see more and more of this um, because of those that have settled in this area. And then the next sort of role or next chapter of this will be in two or three years out from here uh, as a result of the 2017, 2018, 2018. Surge. It's going to be the same thing. Yesterday's right? 15 year olds are, you know, tomorrow's 18, 19 year olds. And, 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 what struck me when I read this story about the butchering in the parks, again, very unfortunately, very common here in, in Maryland, um, several counties here that have that problem, was I, I, I looked at this big MS-13 roundup they had in outside of L.A. a couple of months ago, um, 22 people indicted um, for a number of brutal murders. And the U.S. attorney Nick Hanna from there said, we're seeing an influx of younger gang members coming to the area, associating themselves with the Fulton Click 
who are extremely violent who have to commit murders to join the clique. So what 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 this looks to me is that it's not just incidental. OK, you have criminal Americans, you have criminal aliens, you know, you're just you know, it's a random net. There is a specific pipeline that when you're bringing in such large numbers of young males in particular, but even young females we've had here in Maryland um, with no purpose, no sense of being here, very helter skelter, they have to almost up the ante to be specifically very violent in order to make it in the gang. And, and we're almost like breeding the system by by not securing the border. And this is how it all gets back to the border. And and the thing is, right, and and looking at it through the lens of the cartels, I mean, they're running an organization, they're running a business, if you will. I mean, what better place to stand up your business than in sanctuary cities and now sanctuary states, right? It's just... Oh my gosh, uh, N- Natalie, I wanted to get your, because I know we're running out of time. I, I wanted to get your thought on drugs because I know you, you, you worked in drug enforcement in the 90s. That point you just made. I have heard from DEA agents in Massachusetts and in the Southeast and Atlanta's office that if we were to grab every criminal alien involved in the drug trade, it would make the cost of drugs so prohibitively high because at a primary trafficking level, obviously Americans get roped into it too, but at a primary trafficking level, so so much of this is coming from illegal aliens who are most commonly arrested for what? For drugs. And that's right. those are precisely the people that are being let go. Is that what you're seeing in the Seattle area? So I'm I'm not in tune with with the the drug uh the, those statistics at, at to the Pacific mm. Northwest. Um um but I, I can see where that you know you can you can draw that inference to those you know to those numbers if the statistics are going up. I mean it's certainly if nothing else, this is certainly fertile ground to do so. And it goes right back to the fact that it's just, you know, if these criminal aliens do not have to worry about looking over their shoulder, per se, in the area, what better place than to stand up mm. uh, these types of illegal criminal activities? And that is in a place where they know that, you know, they will be in and out, in and out of the jails uh, because they don't have to fear for for being popped by ICE. Um, until, you know, something really bad happens and they're going to be locked up uh, through the state anyway, if a homicide or those more aggravated uh, cases. Sure. Um, but that we don't have the, the ability or the opportunity to do our part in public safety because politics is getting in the way is a travesty. So I, I, I've held you for very long and my, my gosh, there's so many things I didn't even get to. Just one more quick question. Obviously, the buzz phrase here when you're talking about ICE and immigration enforcement is redressability. Unfortunately, there's so much crime that's not redressable or, you know, it's so hard to have probable cause. Then you got to land a conviction. Then you got to keep them in jail. And increasingly, in many parts of the country, a lot of people, even the worst of the worst, don't serve much time, if at all. And we got to keep dealing with them when it comes to criminal aliens. Obviously, it's it's 100 percent redressable. I mean, the first crime should be the last crime simply because even if you can't land a conviction, but certainly you could get them out of here because they're not ours. They're other countries, criminals in that vein. I wanted to just end off with LPRs. We talked a lot about illegal aliens, but um, the next step, let's say someone is admitted legally, but they're not a U.S. citizen. So they are still a foreign national in the sense that. They're, they don't have an affirmative right to naturalize and be here. It's under our discretion. And until they do, if they commit a crime, well, you know, there's certainly a lot of wonderful immigrants out there. We certainly don't need to add to our criminal population. Um, what I am starting to see, and I'm wondering if you have it in your part of the country, but I could specifically say in Massachusetts, um, where throughout the legal system, whether it's the prosecutors on their own volition or under duress from the politicians, they're finding ways to undercharge or downgrade um, the charges for criminal aliens to ensure it's below the threshold of deportability so that they could remain here and you know continue their recidivism. Are you seeing that as, as an issue? So that that's 
been going on for, for, for quite some time out here. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, we're the Pacific Northwest has sort of been, as as you may well know, is we've sort of been epicenter for for many uh, for significant litigation for class actions as it relates to um, uh, immigration. And so for quite some time, you're you're correct. Uh, we have seen where if you know the difference of the day, right? The 365 days make versus a 364 will change the game for a a, a lapper. Um, and, and I'm not here to suggest that that's that is a conspiracy th- throughout you know the, the Washington State um, uh, system. But yes, you're, you're right. We have seen that on an, on occasion. Um, what what's frequency for quite some time where that sort of sentencing or the charges being dropped to a lower level for a lawful permanent resident uh, works in their favor so that they don't become amenable to removal proceedings. Um, so that's been a, a tactic, a strategy that's been out here for, for, for a while. It's nothing new. And another aspect of sanctuaries I'm seeing are U visas. I couldn't figure out why in your area of operation, there are so many really, and I mean really bad guys I found, like child sex offenders that are applying for U visas. U visas are victims of crime. Um, And I couldn't figure out, like, why is it in a certain area that's a national policy? And then it hit me, oh, it's local law enforcement that have to certify that they're, you know, either a witness or needed or they're a victim of a crime. Is that playing into some of the sanctuary mentality in Washington and Oregon where they're giving out U visas um, or, or at least um, certifying for USCIS more loosely than other places? It, it's definitely, it, it's definitely, uh, to your point, it, it's an, an opportunity that is taken advantage of uh, much more often here than in other parts of the country, yes, um, which is unfortunate because, again, it's like anything else. Uh, you know, you, something is promoted with very good intention, right? Because the concept behind the U visa is actually very good. Sure. I mean, if you have someone here that's here illegally or what have you, and they're able to to assist local law enforcement in the furtherance of, of solving a crime or or getting a really bad guy off the street, I mean, that is a good that's a good program to have. But sadly, as in many things uh, immigration related, it's been so abused uh, with frivolous claims or, or worse, you know, worse than frivolous, and, because m- many times yeah. what, what I'm finding is particularly with MS-13, they'll have a prima facie valid claim because if you're I mean, if you're involved in cartel on cartel, gang on gang activity, you could say you fear from the other guy. It's kind of the same thing with asylum, but. You're, you're all bad guys. And I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen in your area of operation where there's a gang member and I can't get anything from USCIS because he has a pending U visa application. I'm thinking, what in the world? The guy himself is is a bad guy. Right. Right. So, so you're right. That's yet another. And, and, you know, you know, we've got some savvy and some savvy attorneys out here. We've got some very passionate uh, advocacy groups who are part of the grander uh, motivation, right? To to go complete sanctuary. So when you when you pull together all of these various um, uh, uh, efforts, it, it, what we come up against in trying to execute immigration enforcement is again, it's a very tall and it's becoming a wider wall uh, to overcome. And pardon the pun on the wall, I didn't mean it that way, but <laughs> just. <laughs> You know, it's an obstacle for us to do our work. And so uh, you're, you're, you're spot on uh, in identifying these various things that are a little bit more um, uh, Subtle. aggressive <laughs> in this area yeah, than, than in other countries. But uh, I'm sorry, in other parts of the country. But what you I'm sure what you have seen, Daniel, is interestingly, just with the, the, the speed at which many of the other parts of the country are are moving towards sanctuary. I mean, you know, it, it is, uh, to your point, you have several hundred 
areas now that claim their sanctuary, and it is becoming a full-on uh, effort, uh, I think, to 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 shut down the laws that are currently on the books. This is the thing that's the head scratcher. And the time that I was in D.C. for those three years and going on the Hill and discussing, you know, our mission set with staffers of these various congressionals, it's just like, well, I, I don't know what, other than we're doing what's on the books at this point. If you guys don't like it, then change the laws. It just <laughs> as simple as that. We took an oath. I have served. Many of us have served under numerous administrations. And so we carry out the laws, the EO, the executive orders, et cetera, at that time. Um, so really interesting time, really challenging time for us to do our work. But but I but I want to take the opportunity just, just to uh, remind your audience that, uh, you know, our officers stand proud in the work that they do. Uh, they believe in their mission. They are humane. They come across some very difficult situations, uh, yeah. very complicated situations with some of these families. You know, a lot of these people, it, 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 it's just, it can be tough. And yet we do our, our job with professionalism uh, and honor every single day. And it, it's just become so frustrating and so disheartening uh, where we have been vilified, even by members of Congress, um, by the mere fact that we're just simply carrying out the, the laws as they are currently on the books. So um, I, I really appreciate you letting me get this out there. And, uh, and and thanking you for letting us kind of you know get the, get the facts out there. And, and thank you for your very generous time. I know your press uh, p- people are going to have my head if I keep you any longer. I think we set a record <laughs> for a sitting government official. Thanks so much for your general uh, your generous time. It was Natalie Asher, the field office director of the Seattle ICE ERO office. Um, just enforce current law, folks. That is this, it. We are out of time till tomorrow. Enjoy the rest of your day. God bless y'all. This has been another episode of the Conservative Review Podcast.